everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. You know, often on this show, we have success stories, people that have lost tremendous amounts of weight on a plant-based or vegan diet, and often I'm meeting them for the first time. And so I can't even really picture what they looked like before. (laughs) (laughs) She's laughing because today's guest, I knew when she was much heavier than she is today. She has lost over 220 pounds and she's been vegan for a long time. She did it on a plant-based diet. Her new book just came out today. It's a wonderful book. I'll tell you about it because I read it. It's called The B-Plus Diet. Please welcome Judy Finneran. And congratulations, not just on the weight loss, but on publishing your first book today. Oh, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. And after 15 years on my vision board, I get to put a big X across published author and mark it off. Well, you have quite a, I mean, this is, I mean, even if you weren't, even if you didn't ultimately become successful, like you've lost like, like thousands of pounds, really, when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, this is quite a story. And I think you're in your fifties, right, Judy? I'm sorry. Are you in your fifties? Um, no. Forties? Uh, no. Oh, are you, are you older? I mean, I'm 70. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And you are now my new official right. best friend. Well, I didn't, I don't know because what I, I mean, that's, that's even more extraordinary because I, I thought you were like in your fifties and low fifties. And I was going to say, see, it's never too late, but the fact that you're in your seventies, now you really can give people hope because it's never too late. Is it? No. And I, one of my, one of my things I say is you're never too fat. You're never too old and it's never too late. Yeah. I'll be 71 in December. Oh my God. Well, you look amazing. I didn't, I had no idea. And now that, not that 70 is that old, but well, it just proves that it is never too late. And you really, I mean, you know, I struggle with my weight, but then I read your book and you know, the big part about the chair breaking, I mean, things like that. You really did suffer a very long time. Mm-hmm. And that's probably one of my worst memories. Cause that was at a convention with my peers all in the fitness industry. Yeah. It was mortifying. It has to be. Well, what, what's kind of what, what our stories have in common is what people don't realize is you can be overweight and even obese, even if you're vegan. You can. And people say, were you vegan then? And I say, yes, at my all time high weight, 350 plus, I was 100 percent vegan. And they said, how can that be? And I said, because potato chips, onion rings, French fries, they're all vegan. Absolutely. And you got that thing about ordering all, all, I remember that part about ordering all the, through the drive through all the, you, you really liked onion rings, didn't you? I did, but 14 orders, really? <laughs> that's quite a lot. You know, I'm a volume eater, but that, that's quite a lot, 14. You know, but you can make healthy onion rings now, baked onion rings, you know, with the chickpea right. flour, a lot of people do, or oat flour. These were not healthy onion rings. These were jack in the box. Oh boy, I bet they miss you. I don't know. That was a long time ago. <laughs> so but before you even get into this, the weight loss story, what first made you decide to go vegan? I think you said it was 27 years ago. 27 years. Um, I was at a, I was a realtor at the time and I went to a convention and the person was talking. She did after the, after the day portion, there, he, a speaker came on and she was with a company that did health products. And she talked, I mean, that was when she talked about um, all sorts of words I had never heard before, but she mentioned the book um, Fit for Life by Marilyn Diamond. And that was the whole food combining thing. And I bought the book and in the book, I read about the horrible treatment of chickens. And I am an animal lover. And I said, that's it. And I went to Kevin, I said, we're never eating poultry again. He said, Oh, good, because I didn't really like chicken anyway. And that was kind of the start. It was a weird place to start. But a couple months later, I thought, okay, I'm going to take the next step. So I called the same person back and she said, I said, tell me a book that will make me feel about beef the same way I feel about chicken. She said, get beyond beef. So I bought that book. And in the back of the book, it said, go buy a big juicy hamburger with all the fixings and enjoy it because it's the last one you'll want to eat after this. Well, I didn't go buy one because I probably had hundreds of them in my life already. That was the last time I ate beef. And so it was kind of a process that evolved over a year. But the final thing that made me go 100% vegan was um, Diet for New America, John Robbins. And it it just struck so many chords with me, treatment of animals, the environment, ecology, and health, because the main stimulus from the beginning was to lose weight, of course. But there's just so many 
facets to it. And unlike a lot of people who struggle with going plant-based when their other members of the family don't agree, I had four small kids at the time. Um, my twins were four and they're 31. That's how I remember how long I've been vegan. And I, I said, plant food will never come into this house again. And it never did. So everyone had to eat what I made or they had to go fend for themselves somewhere else. And my oldest son, who was like seven, would go eat at his grandma's a lot because she was a very unhealthy cooker. Good cook, but unhealthy. But it never came into our house. I mean, it, we've never had animal foods in our house really since then. It's amazing. And so your family, they supported you on your journey for being plant-based? Well, you they didn't, they, my kids didn't have any choice. My mom, however, thought it was child abuse. She thought I was really abusing my kids and what a horrible mother I was. And she was not supportive. It probably took about 10 years till at holiday meals, she started making some vegan options. So we just always took our own food. But my, the people in the house, Kevin agreed because he didn't really care for that stuff that much anyway. And a lot of people believe you can't have great vegan food. You of all people know that. I've made like many of your recipes. Um, you can have great vegan food. And I can't imagine eating some of that stuff anymore. Did your family stay vegan, your kids? I imagine they're grown now. Actually, um, one of my twins is still nonstop 100% vegan. One was for a long time and now about half and half. My one son who used to go eat at my, at my grandma's, he, at my mom, at his grandma's, he about four years ago finally gave up milk. He had lots of issues. I kept saying, ditch the milk, ditch the milk. He did amazing. His face cleared up, his sinus issues cleared up. But I kept, you know, people have to find their own ways. So this is kind of G-rated maybe a little R-rated. Finally, I told him, Michael, you need to watch the movie, um, the one about the athletes. I can't even think of what it's called right now. Game changers. Game changers. I said, Michael, you're a single man of 30 something years old. These men found that by giving up animal products, they had um, better ability to have better sex lives to, to make it G-rated. He watched the movie Bam, vegan. And I'd been talking to him for 30 something years. That movie was all it took. And yes, now he, and he's become a pretty good vegan cook. That's great. Well, so you never give up either because it took 30 years. I love it. that. See, but well, you know what they say, whatever it takes. And that movie, right. that, that was my favorite scene in the movie, by the way. Yes. That, Did you struggle with your weight before becoming vegan? Like, was it your whole life? I mean, I know the answers yes. to these because I read the book, but not everybody I did. Does. Um, I never, I thought, you know, a lot of us think we're overweight when we're teenagers and stuff, but we're really not looking back. There's times when I wish, oh my God, I wish I weighed what I weighed in high school. Um, my issues with food started two days after my first marriage. I married someone I didn't want to marry. It was kind of a rebound thing, but a one night honeymoon came home to this new apartment Monday morning. He got up and left for work. And I thought, well, what did you do? And they didn't have 7-Elevens in those days, but there was a convenience store next door to us. And I don't even know what triggered this because it was not an issue I had. I walked next door to that store. I bought an eight pack of Hostess donuts. I brought them home. I ate them all. I'm not even into sweets that much. I prefer savory. And then I hid the trash. Looking back, I thought that was your first secret binge eating episode. And I don't even know what caused me to do it, but it was opening the door to another 20 years of sneak and eat, sneak and eat, sneak and eat. Was it powdered sugar or cinnamon sugar? It was the mixed, yeah. it was the mixed box. And I mean, I mean, those aren't even really very good. They donuts. weren't even that good. They had like a, like a waxy chocolate. They weren't really yes, safe. Yes. You're going to eat donuts. Kind of pieces would break off. Yeah. Oh, that's, that is hilarious. Yes. Hey, people might not believe how much weight you lost. So would you please show the back of your book? I would be happy to. This is. Interestingly enough, in that red shirt, ay, 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 there we go. That is me. That is, I can give you the, that's December 15th, 2006. And I am a founding coach with Team Beachbody. And that was the kickoff for the Beachbody meeting. And that look on my face, I'm sitting on stage with, um, not, not a lot of people remember, but if you were around in the 80s, Kathy Smith was a big trainer then, fitness trainer. She had leggings, she's very cute. And I'm on stage with Kathy Smith. There's 40 people there, 38 who had fitness transformation stories and me at 300 pounds. She called me on stage with her. 
And that look on my face, it just breaks my heart to look at him thinking, why am I up on this stage? And I had kind of given up on ever being healthy in that meeting. When I committed to being a weight loss coach, I gave up on giving up and I still struggled and went up and down, but I never gave up again. And so that picture is the day that I made a decision that no matter what, I was never going to give up. Well, you never did. I mean, you know, just some people take a little detour here and there. <laughs> yeah, big detour. <laughs> How You must feel just incredible physically, but I bet you feel very proud of yourself. Yes. And I have to remind myself to be proud of myself because one of the things that I notice, and I'm sure you do too as a coach, is how much people beat themselves up for the past mistakes that they've made. And I spent many years regretting all the bad decisions that I made. And I finally reached a point where I said, I can continue to beat myself up, which serves no purpose. Or I can choose to look at all of those horrible decisions as a lesson, as learning to help me be a better coach. And that's what kind of flipped the switch. And I always tell people on, on calls, do not ever be embarrassed to tell me anything. And they'll say, oh, you can't believe what I did. I said, whatever you have to share, I can beat that story. Because I've got so many horrible stories. I mean, like, hello, four boxes of craft macaroni and cheese at night. I don't think anyone could beat that. Um, I don't think anybody could beat the 14 onion rings. Oh, I don't. I've never had any. Everyone goes, well, no, they'll say, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'll say, have you ever ordered 14 onion rings? They go, oh, no. And I said, well, I have. Then they're kind of, oh. Um, but I'm also, so no story needs to be embarrassing. But also, I'm not easy to get an excuse pass because I've either used them all or I've written them. But I had to learn to be okay with those mistakes because even at 300 pounds, I was able to coach people and I had credibility because they knew I'd been there, done that. They knew I was struggling and they knew I understood. Yeah, I bet. So you're very relatable then to people because I, I think sometimes when coaches haven't struggled, I mean, you can still be a good coach, but I think- right when you experience what the person is, you, you, they can't say, well, you don't know what it's like. You're like, right. uh, yeah, I think I do, you know? Yeah. Right. Amazing. Um, so you've tried just about every diet, right? Why don't, why don't you talk about some of the different diets that you've tried throughout your illustrious career? Is this cereal, you're, you're a cereal dieter. Oh God, I've ne- that's a great term. I'm going to yeah. use that. Sure. And one thing about diets, when people say diets don't work, yes, they do. All diets work when you follow them. They all do. What people do is they don't follow them. They quit too soon, whatever. But I did. um, And there was one theme with all my, all the different programs I tried. I always did the best the first time. And every time I went back, not so much. The one I lost the most weight on, which was also probably the most unhealthy, is I did OptiFast for 10 months. I lost 150 pounds in 10 months. And as I got to my goal weight, I did not want to stop drinking the shakes. And I asked them, can I just stay on Optifast? They said, no, because you will keep losing weight and you will die. I said, what if I have more shakes a day? And they said, no, you need to start eating again. And I said, then I'm going to gain the weight back. Because I had not learned how to have an expectation of not being perfect. And so I was either on a diet 100% or I was off at 100%. So I kept some of it off for a little while. Not only did I gain all 150 pounds back, but another 50 pounds. So I ended up 200 pounds heavier than I started OptiFast the first time. And I probably rejoined several times, each time at a higher weight and never able to stick it out. Um, The weirdest story is Weight Watchers. I started that when I was married to the same husband that I married that was a mistake. And um, I don't know, lost like 70 pounds and then gained some back. And this was in the 80s and everything was not on computer then. So I would do really well. And then I would fall off the wagon. I hate that term now. And I'd go join somewhere else. Now in Weight Watchers, you could rejoin for free if you were a lifetime member. I didn't ever tell them I was a lifetime member because I didn't want to admit I'd fail. So I would always say, no, I'm never been a member before. And I'd pay the full fee. And there were so many Weight Watchers classes around. I joined different meetings every time. And then I started thinking, my name's going to, they're going to, something's going to catch up somewhere. So I started using fake names. 
because that was in the day when you could pay cash and it wasn't computerized. So I think I joined Weight Watchers a total of 27 times, reaching lifetime member, I don't know, 12 times or something. But I didn't know how to just be. I had to be on or had to be off. And if I had one cookie, it was, I've blown it, so I may as well have 12 bags of cookies. And I tell people, one cookie is never going to make you gain weight. It's the guilt we pile on ourselves. It's the emotional message we give ourselves to say, I've already blown, I may as well eat. That's where the weight comes on. Yep. And it's so nice to be able to take a bite of a chip, a tortilla chip, for example, to have one tortilla chip, go, okay, and then not eat more. That's how normal people eat. And I try and model myself after my naturally th thin friends. I watch how they eat. But do you think though, for some people though, abstinence is the best route. And I don't mean, I mean, of like particular foods, like if a real, if a food is really problematic for a person like peanut butter, maybe they shouldn't eat peanut butter. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't have peanut butter in my house. There's certain things I don't, I don't have chips in my house. I don't have, um, I don't have saltine crackers in my house because I would eat a sleep and then another sleep. I just don't have them in my house. The reason is is I don't want to, I don't have to feel like a martyr and prove how strong I am to not go eat them. I don't want to know they're in there. I don't want them calling to me. So I just don't have them in my house. Yeah, that's, well, I've been saying that if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. You right. know, one of the things you talked about in your book is the accountability factor. Mm -hmm. How is that important? Sad to, sad to say, we're all good at making and breaking promises to ourselves. And we don't even give a thought to it. I'm not going to eat. I'm going to stay on my program all day. And then you go off. But who notices, right? Because you didn't tell anybody. And for some reason, when we tell someone else we're going to do something, we're better at sticking to it. I think that account, I always say accountability counts. Being accountable to someone outside of ourselves counts. For the first two years I was on this program, I sent a picture of every single meal I ate to my coach. And often I didn't hear from her for a day or two, but I knew I was being accountable for what I ate. In my group, I still post my tracker almost every day. I post my meals. I mean, my breakfast looks exactly the same every day. I post a picture of it every day. Being accountable helps me stay on track. I think it helps everybody, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't, that's so funny though with Weight Watchers. I wonder if they'll ever like look it up and find out you were a, uh, using a fake identity. Dad, that's kind of funny. You know, people use fake identities for lots of things like to <laughs> crimes, you know, checks, but I've never heard anybody use it to join Weight Watchers for free. That's a first. I, you know what? Chef AJ, I bet no one else other than me has done that or ordered 14. I have a lot of things that I'm probably the only one who's done. Well, you are a, an original, Judy. You write in your book, Why There Are No Cheat Days. Cheating is a choice, not a mistake. I, I agree. I think, I don't think cheat days are really a good idea. Well, and, and I'm just, I'm opposed to the word cheat. Number one, you can cheat on your taxes. You can cheat on a test. You can cheat to do their kids or athletes and get them into colleges. Those things are immoral. They're wrong. Having a potato chip is not immoral. Food is not a moral issue. But again, when we call it a cheat day, we think we're bad. We feel guilty because we've cheated. So we eat everything else. It's the mindset as opposed to saying, that is not interesting. I ate that chip. I wonder what triggered that. And just moving on. It's, it's the mindset. It's the feel, how we feel about the choice we made that makes a decision on what we're going to do next. And cheat day, I hate that word. There's cheat day, um, falling off the wagon, comfort food. That's another term I hate. I don't like it either. Like when people say I ate something because I was bad, you know, or I right, ate right. something I was good. That you're neither bad nor good. You might be bad or good, but not because of what you ate. Not because of what you ate. And comfort food. I some said, oh, comfort food. And I there, I think it's a euphemism. For example, when you say comfort food, and I remember that month we did the unprocessed group where we had a pound of greens every morning. No one ever thinks of kale or broccoli or spinach when they say comfort food. <laughs> comfort food is a euphemism for chunk. But it doesn't feel as bad to say, oh, I wanted some comfort food, to say I wanted some junk. It's, it's kind of more of a reality check when we call it what it is rather than cloaking it in some term. Comfort. Right. It's not comforting. I never felt comforted eating those foods. No. I mean, I was obviously liking instant gratification in the moment, feeling <laughs> bad the whole time and hating myself afterward. Where is the comfort in that? There isn't. Right. So do you know Jeffrey Stein? 
I do. I love Jeffrey. Well, he says, I love Judy Finneran and I cannot lie. Oh, he is so wonderful. He lives all the way in the East Coast. And he was out here and we had breakfast together one day. Nice. It was very nice. You have some fans on. So was your over 220 pound weight loss, was it like a straight shot or were there some dips in the road? And about how long did it take you to lose that? It took me just over two years. And a big, another big part of it is learning to be okay with the number on the scale, because a lot of people say, Oh, don't weigh, don't weigh because they have an emotional attachment to the scale. Like if they have a great day and they don't lose weight, they say, well, I may as well have eaten and they eat. What I learned in my monthly trend in those two years, every month I lost weight, but because I track my weight every single day in a month, there were more days when I stayed the same or went up. Then I lost because it was, I noticed trends. I learned how my body works. So it, it didn't um, bother me because I was trending down all the time. And I'll have someone say, someone told me yesterday, they feel bad when they have a great day and they don't lose any weight. They deprive themselves of good food and they like good food being an interesting term um, that they feel bad. I say, you can't, success is measured by the choices you make, not the number on the scale. We have 100% control of what we put in our mouth. We don't have control of what we weigh in the morning. Great example last night. I had something that I told Kevin when we were eating dinner. It was, it was a vegan product. And I said, I'm not even going to look at the sodium until after I'm done eating. So pro- And I don't eat a lot of processed food, but this was. And I thought, mm, okay, this morning. Okay, and this is almost unheard of. I was up six pounds this morning from yesterday. And I went and looked at the sodium. It was astronomical. Now I know it's all water. And for men, I went, whoa, something's wrong with scale. And I said, oh, well, I had something that's too high of salt. I'm going to drink extra water and it'll be gone. Brown say, oh, this is awful. You just have to be accountable to your choices and not judge yourself based on the number on the scale. Learn from the number on the scale. If there's something you could do better, do it. If you had a great day, you're on the right track and trust the process. Right. So do you recommend uh, uh, to your clients to weigh daily? And is that a behavior you have? Because I know some people feel like, well, once a week's enough or once a month, because some people get really freaked out with the scale. Right. And I used to be one of those people would say weigh once a week. When I started this program, one of the things was to weigh every day. And I decided I was going to do I didn't think I when I started the program, I thought, well, you know, you think, you know, everything, you're a weight loss coach, you've been on these diets, blah, blah, blah. Lesson learned was just because you believe something doesn't make it true. And I thought, I'm going to follow the parameters of this program. Exactly. You think you may know everything, but you're sitting here at 275 pounds. So how is that working for you? So try something new. I have now tracked my weight every single day around the world. I travel with a scale and I weigh every day and I totally believe in it because it teaches like it taught me about the sodium from last night i don't freak out i know what my choices are i track my food every day i know if i've had something that causes me to go up or to go down i'm okay with it because i'm accountable to my choices when you were carrying all that excess weight did you have any health problems associated with having excess weight that's me knocking on wood thank goodness, because I have fabulous genes, I didn't. And I think that's a miracle. And in fact, once I went to my doctor and every time, I mean, I had a 55 resting heart rate, I have great cholesterol, I had great blood pressure. And I said, I was hoping something was wrong. So I would be motivated. And the doctor looked at me and he said, just because these numbers are good doesn't mean you're not killing yourself with fat. So I felt I truly felt like I was walking around with a gun at my head playing Russian roulette. And I thought, how many times can I pull that trigger and have it be a blank? Because I really felt anytime I had a chest pain, I thought I'm having a heart attack. Anytime I had a headache, I thought I'm having a stroke. And three years ago, four years ago, when we were in Ireland, I wanted to kiss the Blarney Stone. And it's a kind of a steep set of stone steps and it goes up maybe three floors, no handrails. And I thought, I'm not going to be able to make it up those steps. And then right at the entrance to the staircase, there was a defibrillator. And I thought, that's your message, Judy. Don't go up those steps. (laughs) 
<laughs> I, and I thought, no. So I sat there and waited, had to wait. Kevin went up, did it. How fun. He got pictures taken. And then two years later, when we went to Scotland, I had lost probably 150 at that time. They, there's a place called Arthur's Seat, which is the highest point in Edinburgh. And it's no stone staircase. It's a muddy, rocky, dirty trail to, that goes up to the top of this mountain where the people up there look like ants. I thought, I'm going to hike into the top of that mountain. And I did it. And at the top of that hill, I thought, you've come a long way from the girl who couldn't kiss the Blarney Stone to having a 360 degree view of Edinburgh. And we leave for Scotland in less than a month. And I think, Arthur seat, been there, done that. Don't have to do that this time. But the, the feeling of being, being able to do that. And I tell people, standing on top of that mountain, knowing I hiked up there, was so much better feeling than any food would ever taste. I would never be willing to trade being able to do that for eating a bowl of ice cream. Nice. Was exercise a, a regular part of your life throughout your life? No, and I'm embarrassed to admit that I relished my dislike of exercise. I was kind of, and this is kind of, I was kind of proud of the fact that I didn't like exercise. I said, oh, those people who jump, oh, I can't wait to exercise, blah, 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 go. Um, and in fact, the first 80 pounds of this particular journey, I didn't exercise. And one of the things I loved about this program was it said exercise is optional. And so I didn't. And then I attended my company convention. Hello, I work for an exercise company. And I thought, I'm just going to do it. And I was going to, I committed to this program that had 100 workouts in it. So because I tend to be a bit obsessive still, not perfect, but obsessive, I decided to do two a day. And that I started July 18th, 2018, which is three and a half years ago. Now I'm excited to say I have not missed one single day of exercise in that whole time. I'm That's on my 13th tennis shoe. I have a tennis shoe where you color in for every day. I'm on my 13th tennis shoe, which represents 1300 workouts. That's incredible. What kind of workouts do you enjoy doing? I love lifting weights. I can't believe I, those words came out of my mouth. I love, I, I like lifting weights better than cardio, but I do cardio. I ride a stationary bike. I love walking. I love hiking. I've done, you can't, I have a huge board up here. That's pro, that's got probably 20 calendars up there of workout programs I've completed. Cause I'm real visual. I put stickers on every day. I, I just do something every day to qualify. I have to do an official workout. I have to walk at least three miles or I have to do something exercise related nonstop for 30 minutes to qualify for an exercise day. Nice. I love the sticker system. I, I would use that with my clients for they, every day they ate vegetables. You know, they put the sticker. I think that's really inspiring. I love stickers. Yeah. yeah. You get good ones. Like you get, I get fruits and vegetables, Scooby-Doo, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. they, had a, they have a great sticker store at the farmer's market at Thurn Fairfax in case you need sticker for her. Mm -hmm. That's it. Hey, uh, so Diane, who's watching live, and how are you feeling, by the way, Diane, uh, wants to know, did you have loose skin? And if so, how did you deal with it? Oh, that I, you know, I get that question probably at least once a week. People say, can I ask? Well, I get two questions. One, did you have weight loss surgery? And I say, no, because to be successful with weight loss surgery, you have to change how you eat. And I decided if I had to change how I eat, I'd do it without chopping up my body inside. Um, the other one is, did you have weight loss surgery? I mean, weight skin loss, skin surgery removal. And I say, no. They said, why don't you have any loose skin? I say, have you seen me naked? Have you <laughs> see me in hot pants? Have you seen me in a sleeveless blouse? Of course I have loose skin. There's 220 pounds gone from under this skin. How could, I mean, it doesn't magically disappear. Yes, I have loose skin exercising, I think helps a little bit. It's not going to take it away. And I consider it my badge of honor. You know, I will lose skin will not kill anyone. 220 pounds of unhealthy, obese fat can easily kill you. And I have people tell me, oh, I don't want to lose weight because I'm afraid I'll have loose skin. I say, uh -huh. I have just a plan for that. And they say, what? I said, go ahead and lose all the weight. And if you have loose skin and you're unhappy, you can gain all the weight right back. And they say, well, that's stupid. I say, duh. 
I love it. I love it. Yeah, but that's yeah. I mean, I only lost fifty pounds, and I have loose skin. But like you say, very few people. Well, actually, only one person sees me naked. So I just it's right. They don't see me, and they don't see me in hot pants and tank tops either. Yeah. Nice. You write in the book. I, I took a little notes here. All of the A plus habits for a B plus lifestyle. Expound on that a little bit, and maybe why the book is called the B plus diet. And what is the B plus diet? Is it vegan? What do we? What are we Eat. What the B plus to? diet is not a diet. The B plus diet is a mindset. Many years ago, I was involved. I was I was a, had a management position in a wine company. I owned a women's networking organization that had 150 chapters across the U.S. and Canada, and I was a beach body coach. So I was running three full time businesses simultaneously, and you can't do three businesses as well as you can do one. And I was at an event, I was in a mastermind program and it was a weekend and, and it was came to a point where they said, stand up and share what you took, you're taking away. And I said, I'm taking away that I'm going to do one business. I'm going to just do one business. I said, I'm stepping down from my position with my wine company because it's fun, but I'm sure a lot of weight came from that. Um, and I'm selling my networking organization and a lady at my same table said, I'll buy it. Like that was meant to be because I had spent so much of my life having to be the best at everything. I had to be the teacher's pet. I had to have the highest grade in every class or I'd quit. And I started thinking, you know, I bet all those B and C students in my classes have great lives too. And they didn't kill themselves over it. And I thought, I have to stop trying to be perfect. And I was at an event where uh, Tony Robbins spoke and a quote that probably hit me more than any other quote I've ever heard. It was perfection is the lowest, the lowest possible standard you can set your, for yourself because it's impossible. So all those people say, well, I have to do it perfectly. I'm not going to do it at all. Well, the bottom line is you're not going to do it at all because no one does it perfectly. Right. And even people that people think do it perfectly really don't. Like people right. accuse me of being perfect. They don't see me all the time. You know, maybe they might see me at a conference and like, oh, she's so perfect because I'm not eating. You know, generally I find when people accuse people of being perfect, it means, oh, they're not eating crap. <laughs> right, right. And, and people like in some of my groups, they'll, they'll lambast someone for not being perfect. And I think, I want to go be a fly on the wall in that person's house because I think anyone that's that, if you spot it, you got it. I often think that's project. They're nagging on you for something you're doing. It's because they feel bad. They're doing it. Um, so I, I have, and it's a process I'm learning to be able to make a choice, have it not be the best choice and say, okay, I learned from that and move on that. I don't have to take 75 steps backward because I made one poor choice. That's the B plus diet, being able to understand your human. And um, now I can't, the compound effect, a great book. And he gives an, it was a business book, but he gave a food example. He said, if someone eats a salad every day for, a, for lunch for a year, at the end of the year, they most likely will weigh a little less. If someone eats a hamburger every day for lunch for a year, it, they will most likely weigh more in a year. But from day to day, there's not much notice. It's learning to be okay with some decisions that you make occasionally, but not every day. Perfect example, when we were in Scotland two years ago, um, I stayed on my food plant. I weighed every day, but we went to three distilleries. And you better believe I tasted that whiskey. I was in Scotland. I was not going to taste whiskey. But those days, I didn't say, okay, I've had this whiskey, so I'm going to have I'm gonna eat this, I'm going to eat this. I didn't. I just had the whiskey. Because who knew if I'd be back there again? Who knew if I'd have another opportunity? I didn't gain weight. That's how normal people live. If they have an ounce of whiskey, they move on. They don't um, eat for four days because of that. That's, that's the B plus diet. It's, it's what's between our head. It's what's in here that determines whether we're successful or not. Because there is no new, new information on how to lose weight. We all know what to eat. We all know what not to eat. There's no new information. It's doing it that yeah. makes a difference. And do that's you, right here. Do you know the celebrity vegan fitness trainer, John Pierre? Because a lot of what you say is exactly what he says to his clients. Too. I love John Pierre. And one of the, at your house, the story he told about cheese, and I'm sure you remember that story about, and the udders and all that, that his little talk that has stuck in my mind 
it's been what, five years? And every time someone says, I have a hard time giving up cheese, I said, let me tell you what Jean-Pierre says. Um, yes, I know that. So that's, that's was pivotal for me. And he, he's amazing. And I'd love seeing both of you at that class in your house. Cause he always says, if you don't fix this, you can't fix this. Right. 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 Yeah. That's, 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 and, um, and when he talks about the perfection, he says, like, if you broke one of your grandmother's teacups, you wouldn't take a hammer and break all of right. them. That's what people do with food. Oh, I ate a cookie. Well, I'll eat the whole sleeve. Right. right. Yeah. Or that thing that you go out and you find your t- one tire slot. So you slash the other three. That's the diet mindset. The mm-hmm. B plus diet is not a diet. It's about a mindset. I, I am not on a diet. This is my food. Mm-hmm. We feel if we're deprived, if we're on a diet, we can't have this. We can't have that. There's foods I don't eat anymore. I don't feel deprived because they're not my food anymore. This is how I eat. This is my food. And rather than try and replicate old recipes, I find new things to like. Yep. And I'm, I'm grateful for my food every day. Well, Myrta says, one day I will share a meal with Judy Finneran, who's an inspiration. Oh, yes, you will, Chica. Yeah. And somebody said, why didn't she tell her age? She did at the beginning, 71. 70 and three quarters. I'll be 71 Almost. in December. That's good. Sagittarius? Absolutely, baby. Uh, yeah, that's, good. that's a great sign. Jeffrey says, the B-plus diet gets an A-plus. Why don't you buy the book on Amazon and write that? That'll help her out, I bet you, if you did that. You know, I was thinking back to when you said how much success you had with protein shakes, because Oprah did too. And the thing is, is I always say to people, if what you're doing isn't sustainable, the results won't right. be permanent. It was interesting how like you intuitively knew you had to continue doing this right. to be successful. And so- you, I mean, ostensibly, you really couldn't. I mean, I guess you could do it forever, but I don't know how enjoyable that be. But now it sounds like you know that what you eat to lose weight is what you have to eat to maintain your weight. Right. And, it, and one of the very first things I tell my clients is, this is sad, but true. You have to understand that how you can never, ever, ever eat the way you used to eat and weigh what you want to weigh. And that's the difference in a diet. A diet um, or like people say, well, what if I only eat one meal a day? And I say, are you prepared to do that for the rest of your life? No, then that's a diet. Right. Well, that's why I've never, you know, people accuse me of bashing weighing and measuring programs. I think they're very effective, but I don't know very many people that can do that forever. Mm-hmm. You have, you have to be willing to know you use the perfect word. If it's not sustainable long-term, it's a diet. Absolutely. You got it, baby. Would you mind sharing what you, what kind of foods you eat? Maybe take us through what I eat in a day. I would be happy to. And I'll start with lunch because I, I, and I share my pictures of my food a lot. I have a salad every single day with beans on it every single day. And I just finished like an hour before we were talking and people say, don't you ever get tired of eating salad? I say, no, I got tired of being morbidly obese. I got tired of popping out of my five X clothes. I got tired of thinking I was dying. I'll take a salad every day because I love it. Um, I have Shakeology every morning for breakfast, which is a a product my company makes. This morning I had um, an entire head of romaine lettuce in it. And I had uh, six cups of spinach and had a banana and a cup of cashew milk. Dinner is the only meal that really varies. I do um, some combination of beans and greens, veggie chili, split pea soup over cauliflower rice. Kevin makes a great bean bowl. Um, or sometimes I'll just have beans and a veggie. Two nights ago, I had just had a big pile of steamed broccoli and a third of a cup of, um, three quarters of a cup of black eyed peas. I, my meals are very simple and they're all a habit. And a lot of people say, I need a lot of variety. And I think, I think sometimes that's another excuse because I know I used to have Burger King every single day for lunch, Burger King or Mexican food every single day at all. And that was an, I didn't need variety. When people say they need more variety, I think they want a variety of a not so healthy food. <laughs> right. Oh, I got, I, you know, so much of what you say just reminds me of me. Cause even when I was a binger, I didn't like, I was always the same thing. It wasn't like right. different right. types of candies, cakes, cookies, pies, and ice cream. I think people overestimate their need for variety and you can get it on a plant-based diet. I mean, you mentioned you have beans every day. I don't think people know there's 18,000 different kinds of legumes. So you could right. have every bean in the whole world. Right. And cooked 50 different ways. Like people say, I hate vegetables. And I'll say, have you had every vegetable? Have you tried them every way? And did your mom cook vegetables poorly? Most often they grew up having vegetables cooked poorly. 
I mean, yeah. oh, I made frozen green beans the other night. Kevin said, oh, I have bad memories of frozen green beans. I guess his mom will cook them. When he had them, I put some real lemon on them. I squeezed lemon juice on them. He goes, these are pretty good. I didn't cook them the way your mom did. And so many people keep, just because you believe it doesn't make it true. They don't think vegetables are good, but they're unwilling to try them new ways or different vegetables. Right. And when people tell me, I hate broccoli, I hate Brussels sprouts or a cauliflower, I put it in the air fryer and all of a sudden they love it. Right. Right. Yeah. I love that. Have you tried every vegetable? Yeah. Well, see, that's the thing. See, because you're, you're not going to take their excuses because you have, you've already used every single one. So you probably could write another book, every excuse in the book. <laughs> And the truth behind that excuse, I need variety. I want to eat junk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What? Well, yeah, it's like this, this is when they say this, they mean this. Yeah. Right. right. Um, Belinda asks, what did Jean-Pierre say that stuck so well? Oh, hopefully this is rated okay. What Jean-Pierre said that day at your house, I remember watching him. He said, the FDA has guidelines, which we all know how lax those are, on how much pus and feces can be in milk. He said, and when that percentage per volume is exceeded in the milk, they are, however, made allowed to make it into cheese. And as a former cheese eater, I went, that is just gross. And then he talked about the condition of cows and like how their udders hang into their own waist and they pull their udders out of there and hook them up to the milk. I mean, he painted such a picture for cheese that day that I've shared that story probably 50 times. And I always credit him, always credit him. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I use that a lot and people are grossed out as they should be. Right. You mentioned in the book that water is very important, drinking water. Why is that? Our bodies are naturally made up of water. Um, we, I, th I think a lot of Americans walk around in a chronic state of dehydration. And this was another big change for me when I did this. I used to not drink any water. There was one time in my life when I drank probably two to 300 ounces of diet soda a day. In fact, Which one? I may, I ask, may I ask what flavor? Because I used to be a- Diet Coke or Diet yeah. Pepsi. I like Diet Coke the best. Yep. And in fact, when I did Optifast, and this is going to really gross people out, I mixed my Optifast into Diet Coke instead of water. But you could only have it half full because it would be like that, those volcano experiments. <laughs> So I had to let it, but I was hooked on Diet Coke. Then I, I, I'm 13 years diet soda, artificial sweetener free, but I still didn't drink water. And this program said I needed to drink water. So I started very slowly. Um, number one, yes, it helps you feel full. Often people have a headache, they're thirsty. They're fatigued, they're thirsty. They don't feel well, they're thirsty. They don't recognize how dehydration can show up. So I started very small and worked my way up and worked my way up. The goal, if you look at most places, how much water to drink, it's typically half your body weight. That's what I had to work to. Although when I got to 100 ounces a day, I said, I'm sticking here till my weight comes down below 200 and then I'll be at half my body weight. Now I routinely drink 100 to 150 ounces of water a day without thinking about it. I created a new habit, a habit I was resistant to, a habit I didn't believe in. But I told myself, shut up and just do it. And I did. And it's amazing. It's another incentive to lose weight. You don't have to drink as much water because that's quite a bit. If you, if you weigh more. Yeah. Half your weight in ounces. That's what I've always heard. Nice. Let's see if there's any more questions in the chat. Guys, I've been posting the link in the chat. It's in the show notes of where to get the book. This would be really great if you got it today because it would really help her out. Um, Tracy says, how long did it take her to lose 220 pounds? About two years, right? The last hundred, the first 70 ish kind of off and on, off and on, off and on over the years, the last 150 in two years. Nice. Has anybody that we know seen you and been uh, just awed by your success? Um, you know, I, I, I can't, I don't see, I guess I don't, because for the last year and a half, we haven't been anywhere. Um, my kids think it's kind of amazing um my friends and, and just my wonderful facebook family nice nice so you coach people like like in groups or individually both both yeah mm -hmm. well i bet you're a great coach because you've walked you know you walk the talk and you've been on the path so and i just want to do a little plug for my book i do have a few 
copies that they can order directly from me if they message me that I'll sign and send out. Nice. And I'm reading your 5'4", so you weren't really, you're not very tall. So that must have been. No, 350 plus pounds at 5'4", is pretty morbidly obese. Right. It was hard to get around. You know, again, I think I got around pretty well considering because I remember that trip when we went to Blarnstone, Kevin kind of dragging me all over. And now we in Scotland last time we walked eight to 10 miles a day with no issue. It was hard, but I didn't know it. You know, I, I pick up something that weighs 50 pounds right now. I think, oh my God, that weighs a lot. I think, how did you walk? How did you stand with 220 pounds more on you? I don't physically know how I did. It. I, I know that's like, two, that's like two of me or with this one, right. of me, one of Mary McDougal. And it's like, right. I, I, it's amazing. I guess, cause it didn't come on overnight. So you, no. you, you that's, you, that's amazing. Although I was really good at gaining weight too. That first wedding, I gained 50 pounds the first six months. Wow. And told people it was my birth control pills. And you weren't, you didn't, you weren't overweight as a child, right? Not really. I mean, I was a little pudgy here and there, but not really. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we have an Aussie in the house wanting to know if the book is available on Kindle. It should be soon. We were having some issues with the EPUB file, so it's not available via Kindle soon, but it should be within, I would say, by next week at this time. Thanks. Because uh, she's in Australia, I guess you can't get it on Amazon. Susan says, Judy is forgetting about her camper family that didn't recognize her. Hmm. I, well, my camper family, we, have, we belong to a motorhome club, and we go every month. Um, and they kind of saw me through the process. So I guess, I guess I didn't know they didn't recognize me because the change was month to month. It wasn't, they didn't see me for two years and there I was. Right. What do you say to somebody who's given up hope that they couldn't lose weight? What, what, what do you say to that person? You're wrong. Nice. And I can support you. If I can do it at 70 years old, you can do it. So here's the most sensitive question I'm going to ask you. And I don't think, I don't think it's too personal because you're, I think you're a straight shooter, but there's been, a, I've been watching a lot of people over the last 10 years and a lot of them in the public eye, some of them, you know, vegans doing great things that have lost a lot of weight, like you, anywhere from 50 to hundred, 200, 300 pounds. And some of them have gained all of it back, some of it back. Do you worry that that could happen to you? No. And this, and this is the only time in my life I've ever been able to say this. Only because I always knew I would gain it back. No, because I've been maintaining for probably a year and a half within a five to 10 pound ratio. And because I weigh every day, because I monitor my choices and because I'm not trying to be perfect, I know that's not going to happen. For example, like the six pounds yesterday, what do I need to do? I need to drink a lot of water, have a shake for breakfast, have my salad for lunch. I'm going to have um, cauliflower, rice and beans tonight for dinner. Because I'm constantly paying attention to it, because I'm tracking every day. Here's another excuse. Why don't you track your food? Oh, I don't have time. It takes five minutes a day. I forgot what I ate. Take a picture. Um, so I, there's no excuse other than you don't want to write down what you ate. Mm. I write down what I ate. Yep. Well, I've read that people that do that are more successful. I don't do it anymore because I kind of eat the same thing every day, but I think I did it for five years after mm -hmm. I lost weight. And then I'm like, you know what? Sweet potatoes and broccoli every day. And like you, you know, I, the only meal that really changes is dinner. Cause it's so easy to not have to like, think about right. making all right. these food decisions. Right. I get my dinner stuff out. The, I mean, my breakfast stuff out the night before I get my workout clothes out the night before. So I wake up ready to go into my routine. It's not a rut. It's a routine. It's a healthy routine. People say, oh, yeah, that's such a rut. No, it's a routine. A rut is getting up, eating junk, feeling badly, hating yourself, having your clothes not fit. I can walk into my closet every single day and know everything in here will fit. And that is so liberating to me. Do you see any of the same doctors now that you saw when you were heavy? And obviously, they've had to have noticed, right? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Kaiser member, so I've had my same doctor for several years, and they're, they're obviously very happy with my weight loss. Yeah. Did they ever um, recommend for you to have gastric bypass? No. Nice. That's no. good. Back, I back in the day is when they suggested Optifast to me, and that's when I did it. Nice. Here's a question from um, Malin. What are your thoughts on homemade fresh vegetable juices? Um. 2011, I did a juice fast 
And because I'm all or nothing at all, I watched <laughs> that sick and nearly dead. Told Kevin, I'm going to do a 60 day juice fast. He said, I knew you would. Went out the next day, bought a juicer, did a 60 day juice fast. Because I'm a slow loser, I lost 30 pounds. Most people lose double that or more. Um, I think they're, they're healthy. They're good to drink. Do I recommend a juice fast? No, for the very word you said earlier, it's not sustainable. If you want to juice for the rest of your life and eat no food, okay. But otherwise it's a diet. I did it, been there, done that. It's checked off my list. I don't ever want to go back. There were times at night, like 6 PM, I would be in tears because I wanted to chew something so bad. And believe it or not, I was wanting broccoli. Um, I just wanted to chew. And I would tell myself, and this is a tip I give people, delay, not deny. I would tell myself, you've done so good all day. Just go to bed and wake up tomorrow. And if you want to eat tomorrow, you can. And then the next morning, I'd be so happy I didn't eat. I'd say, okay, I can do it one more day. And I may be in tears again that six o'clock that night, but that's how I made it through those 60 days. And that's what I tell people. You're not depriving yourself of anything. You're simply saying, I'm not going to have this this time. You're not saying you can never have it again. Just choose not to have it today. I know. That's just all it takes is a series of good decisions. It sounds like when you do something, you're all in. Like you just, you're like all or nothing. Like when you try things. I am. And, and the word that shifted is if I have a chip, I don't beat myself up and I stay on the track. Nice. Do you still have onion rings? Um, I've had onion rings probably three times in the last three years. There's a restaurant, a vegan restaurant that's downtown San Diego that makes great onion rings. And Kevin and I split an order. Nice. Well, that, that's just amazing. Uh, how, how, how does he feel about your success? I bet he thinks uh, you're amazing. He, he, I am so lucky because he's thought I was amazing at 350 pounds and he thinks I'm amazing now. And wow. I'm I, I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean that you weren't amazing before. I mean, like what you did was amazing. You know what I mean? I think he thinks that anytime I decide I'm going to do something, I do it. I think it's kind of routine to him. She said she's going to do it. Okay, she's going to do it. <laughs> well, it just shows that you put, when Judy puts her mind to something. But, you know, other people can do it, too. That's the thing. As anyone can do it. You just have to decide. You know, Beachbody's logo is decide, commit, succeed. And that is so succinct. It doesn't start with the food you eat. It starts with the mindset. Because I tell people... <clears throat> When you are 100% committed, there's always an answer. I get a question. You can't do this when you're traveling. You can't do this when you're restaurant. You can't do this when you're at a friend's house. You're at blah, 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 blah. Excuses, excuses, excuses. When you're 100% committed, there's always a way. When you're not 100% committed, there's always an excuse. Two yeah. years ago, when we went to Ireland, my goal was to lose five pounds in Ireland. We were there for 31 days, three years ago. And I said, my stretch goal is to break the 200 pound mark which would be um, nine and a half pounds. I reached that two days before we left Scotland. So I was on vacation for 31 days, having a fabulous time. And I lost nine and a half pounds on that vacation. And I had fun. Vacation doesn't mean you have to eat. Vacation is about memories, people, sights, experiences. It doesn't have to be about food. Wow. Question from Kathy. Where did it go? Why does Judy think she's a slow weight loser? My sister's a slow loser. Do you think it's from years of yo-yo dieting? Yes, I think I've crushed my metabolism. It's exactly what I think it is. I've lost, and I used to call myself the queen of the weight lost and found department because I have lost in town. And yes, I have done the math close to 3000 pounds as an adult. And every time you lose weight and gain it back, it's harder the next time and harder the next time and harder the next time. So I have a very slow metabolism and I, I've come to accept it because I'm the one who wrecked it. Wow. You're awesome. Thanks. How are you? <laughs> I just think I, I guys get the book. It's a really good book. I read it and then it, you'll never, ever feel ashamed again of anything you've done in the area of weight loss or, or binging or food addiction. Cause Judy has seen it all done it all. No judgment. And wow. She has triumphed. Must feel great to be you. Look it, forward to it feels great. And what, what feels even better is the amazing people I support because I, one of the pivotal thing that one of my, when I was in real estate, one of my coaches said, my coach said to me, if you believed in you half as much as I believe in you, you'd be unstoppable. And I pass that on to my 
clients, whether they believe in themselves or not, I believe in them. I know they can do it. And I say, if you're doubting yourself, borrow my belief. Nice. Well, you must be great at what you do. Other than buy this book, which just came out today on Amazon and will be on Kindle soon. Hey, is there going to be an Audible, Judy? I don't know. I haven't even got that far. That's a great idea. Yeah. This is all so new to me. Yeah. Did, did you, tell, did, did a publisher find you and then want to tell your story? No, we self-published. Oh, nice. Well, then you can, you can certainly do, I can help you with that. I mean, it's very, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's very doable to get an audible. Okay. That'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. You could do it yourself or there's like the, you just click a button and then they, they hire somebody. So yeah. I'd rather do it myself. Although I don't like hearing my voice, I probably wouldn't listen to it either. Right. Well, you don't really hear your voice. You, usually you get a director that kind of helps you in the booth, but I guess some people, you know, do it themselves without anybody, but it's kind of fun. Actually, I did the pleasure trap do it as well. So how fun. I would like nice. that. Thank you um, for the tip. Yep. Apple says the ebook is on Kobo. I never heard of Kobo. I don't know what that is. Me neither, but she says it's there. So that is. I don't even know what that means. Yeah, me neither. So what, do you, what does that mean, Apple? So other than get the book, uh, do, you, do you like when people follow you on any particular social media? Platform? Yeah, um, I'm very, I, it was so funny when you said kind of a personal question. My life is an open book. When people say I have a personal question, I say, I can't imagine what that would be. Um, you're welcome to follow me on Facebook. You're welcome to message me if you need my support. In the book, there are a ton of bonus materials that you can download, my tennis shoe sneaker, my um, kitchen gadget list, all my tools, all my visual tools that use stickers are there. So you're welcome to, to subscribe to all those and just, I'm happy to help. You can do it. I believe in you. Oh, wow. You're, you're amazing. So happy to connect with you Thank again. You. Congratulations. Not just on the weight loss, but a book. I know it's not the easiest thing to uh, have a book. And Pam says she loves your voice, which would mean you're perfect to do your own audible. I always think I sound like a 12 year old. Yeah, I don't think anybody really loves the sound of their own voice because also it sounds different to us, I think, than other people's. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't like to hear mine. So Kobo apparently is an alternative to Kindle for people who don't want to shop on Amazon but love to read. See, I always say, I just said this yesterday to somebody in an interview that I literally learned something new every day doing this show and that Kobo, I, I've never so heard So how that. do they get it? I don't know. Hey, how do they get? Oh, it's a bookstore. So I'm guessing there's a website. Maybe you could post that Apple. See, I love that. Learning new things every day. And you guys can learn a lot of new things by reading the B plus diet. Well, thanks so much, Judy. And, and it was my pleasure. success with this book and maybe you'll come on again. Oh, I know somebody, I forgot one question. I, I missed it from Jeannie. How do you prepare your beans? She wanted to know. Um, how do you cook them? Well, when I'm really lazy, I use the electric can opener, drain the water and eat them with a spoon out of the can. When I'm more motivated, and I do this probably two times a week, I have a three quart Instant Pot, which I call my bean pot. I love my Instant Pot. I have one in my house, one in my motorhome. And I subscribe to the fabulous Rancho Gordo Beans, hashtag Rancho Gordo Beans. I get my bean chip and I make at least two a week in my Instant Pot. As they start to get low, I add more. We do always do garlic, we always do onion. And then based on the type of bean, we put this Kevin Spice guy, like if they're pinto beans, we do all Mexican spices. Um, we do like white beans, we do a rosemary thing. All we do is alter the spices and I cook them in the Instant Pot, put them on my salads every day. And as it gets low, I put another pot on. That sounds great. Well, thanks. So oh, we just, hey, Queen of Aries just gave a chat donation. Almost missed that. Thanks. All right, Judy, I hope the book uh, Thank you. Goes, uh, goes to number one. Take care so much. And, and thanks. It's great all to you. see you. It's so great. And blue is your color, girl. Let me tell thank you. Thank you. Sure. And purple's mine, I hope. Everybody, thank you so much for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we also have two shows. At 11 a.m., we have a vegan doctor from Costa Rica named Dr. Miranda Graham. And at 2 p.m., a cooking demo with Nick DeVorn from Local Spicery. And I think he's making a Japanese hot pot. Thanks, Judy.